Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's message is from St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is our text. Our Lord Jesus Christ is a man on a mission. After his transfiguration, the scripture says that he set his face toward Jerusalem. We should be glad that he is going to Jerusalem, but very few people want him to go there. For when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, things are going to get shaken up, literally and figuratively. As we heard last Wednesday, things are going to go a little bit upside down when Jesus gets to Jerusalem. Jesus' own disciples don't want him to go to Jerusalem. When Jesus tells his disciples that the Son of Man must be betrayed and hand, given over into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again, Peter says, No, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And now today we hear that the Pharisees don't want Jesus to go to Jerusalem. Get away from here, they say. And not for our sakes. Oh, no, not for our sakes. But Herod wants to kill you. You know, Jesus, you and us, you know, we, we Jews, we're on the same page. But that, that evil Herod wants to kill you. Yeah, right. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to Jesus. And, of course, our ears perk up. Well, what else was going on at that very hour? Why did this, why were the Pharisees pushed over the edge at this hour? If you'd like to turn to Luke 13 and see what's going on, uh, page 1620 in your pew Bibles, we'll get a little background here. The last time stamp that we have is in chapter 13, verse 10. On a Sabbath, uh-oh. Jesus is doing something on the Sabbath again. They've already told him he can't do stuff on the Sabbath, but here he goes again. So he's teaching in the synagogues, verse 11. A woman who was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Okay, calling somebody a hypocrite really doesn't get you in their good standings, does it? This is, this is not how you win friends and influence people. It's a good thing Jesus isn't running for elected office here, okay? Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Huh? Don't you? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free from the Sabbath day from what has bound her? And when he had said this, verse 17, all his opponents were humiliated. What is the absolute worst thing that you can do to anybody these days? Embarrass them. Kick them in the shins, stomp on their feet, give them Dutch rubs, but you dare not embarrass anybody, right? But all the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. So then Jesus goes on to teach in verses 18 through 21 about the mustard seed in the yeast that grow into be big, wonderful things that nobody expects from them. But then in verse 22, he really seals his fate. 
He says in verse 24, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able to. Once the owner of a house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and, in, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping, and there, will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. And then verse 30, Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. And now, at that very hour, now this is what pulled the trigger for the Pharisees. And they say, get out of here. We don't want you anywhere close. Thank God Jesus was a man with a mission, with his face set steadfastly to Jerusalem. He ignores the warning. He's dealt with Herod's in the past, and this one is no threat to him. This is Herod Antipas, the king of ten cities in the northern part of Israel, not Herod the Great, who oversaw the building of the temple. Jesus dealt with that Herod back in the days of his birth, when Joseph and Mary carried him off to Egypt and stayed there until the first Herod passed away. The second Herod is no real threat to Jesus. <coughs> Yes, John the Baptist was beheaded by that very guy. But even at his trial, Herod is no threat to Jesus. Herod was glad to see Jesus, for he hoped to see him perform some miracle. The, the order for execution came not from Herod, but from Pilate, whom Herod sent him back to. So, this Herod is no threat to to Jesus. The Pharisees are only using this as a ruse, a guise to get Jesus out of there. Jesus replies, anyway, go tell that fox, that clever person, that, that schemer, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. That's a man on a mission. Specific, attainable, measurable goals. That's what we are taught all the time that we need to have specific, attainable, and measurable goals. I will reach my goal. I will heal people. I will defeat the power of the devil. And on the third day, and that echoes in our minds, I will reach my goal, the salvation of souls through the resurrection of the dead. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Ah, to have a man on a mission is a wonderful thing. But to have a compassionate man on a mission is an even better thing. As we were telling the kids up here, mother hens want their chicks to come under their wings so that they may be protected. Life that gives life to other life, it's their natural thing. Our God who created us and breathed into us the breath of life. How much more does he want us to be his forevermore? And so yes, there is this divine, unimaginable sorrow when his chicks, his children, flee from where his shelter is to be found. And we are so good at doing that. The Old Testament lesson has an example of just one of the prophets, Jeremiah, bringing the word of the Lord to the people. The people absolutely reject it because it means bad news for their city and their livelihood. Only know for certain, Jeremiah says, that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in the truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words into your ears. The Lord has given us the Holy Scriptures. He has given us pastors and teachers to bring that faith to the people that we may know the difference between right and wrong. 
that in the Ten Commandments we see how God wants us to live our lives in relation to Him and in relation to one another. In those commandments we see that we really don't have a clue as to the difference between right and wrong had not the Lord shown it to us. And when we do find out the difference between right and wrong, we often rebel against it. Just as children will rebel against parents for whatever they tell their children to do. In the musical The Fantastic, there's that wonderful line, Why do kids put beans in their ears? Because we told them no. Why do kids put jam on the cat? Because we told them no. Well, in the same way, we rebel against God. And it causes him such divine sorrow. Paul echoes that sorrow in today's epistle lesson. Many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. It does bring pain and sorrow to parents to see their children fall into sinful ways. Sinful ways and addictions and lifestyles that are detrimental to their well-being. And sometimes their kids seem deliriously happy chasing after these things, but their parents see it and are tremendously saddened. The same thing with pastors and their flock. And Paul and his flock at Philippi. And now I tell you, even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. As it was in the days of Jeremiah, it was so in the days of Paul, and it is today in 2013. We chase ends that lead only to destruction. After very temporary earthly glories. And sadly, we have turned our consumption into our God, whether it be for our belly in food and drink, whether it be for our ears and eyes and entertainment and lustful pursuits, whether it be for the sensual pleasures of the body, we chase after those things and make them our gods. And they glory in their shame. Where do you want to start with that one today, folks? But all the stories that you see on the internet and newspapers and television, put them all in a wheel, spin it, and you'll end up most likely with people glorying in shameful, shameful, sinful behavior. And the worst part of it is that the Jeremiah's and the Paul's and the Christ's of the world who will bring the word of God to show people their sinful ways, they are the unloving ones. They are the wrongdoers. The greatest sin is to embarrass anyone because of a lifestyle choice that they have made. The biggest faux pas that someone can commit is to assert that there are norms in society and that there is normal behavior and abnormal behavior. You say that and now you are, you are the outcast. You are the Jeremiah. You are the Christ. You are Paul in prison writing to the Philippians. Does that excuse us? God so loved us, how can we not love one another? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. We've been having a series of wonderful Bible studies this past few weeks that talk about that very thing. Those who stand up for their faith must feel like they are just getting stones thrown at them right and left. How often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you simply would not. Just as the chick 
who will run away from the hen when the buzzard approaches will be snatched up and devoured. So are the children of God who stray from his word and think that they're just fine, just the way they are, and don't need any protection from anyone else. The devil prowls around, seeking to destroy them and to consume them. Look, I tell you, your house is left to you desolate, Jesus declares. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the good news. I haven't had a lot of good news for you today, but this is the good news that Jesus gives to them and to us. You will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a prophecy. Prophecies have an immediate and ultimate fulfillment quite often in the scriptures. And there's an interesting way that the Gospels are written here. In Luke, we have, Blessed are you, uh, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord prior to Palm Sunday. And indeed, Jesus enters into the Jerusalem to be killed on Palm Sunday. So there is an immediate fulfillment of the prophecy there. But Matthew points us to an even greater ultimate fulfillment. Matthew records this particular exchange after Palm Sunday, showing us that there is yet one more coming of the Lord. There is one more coming of the Lord when we will see Him. And that is at the end of time, when He shall come to judge the living and the dead. And those who respond to His call will be glad to see His coming. And those who have refused His call throughout this life will flee at His coming at that time. You who have heard these words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, know that it means good things for you. For with the Lord comes mercy and love and forgiveness and the promise of salvation and peace that passes understanding. With the coming of the Lord means his presence in your daily life to give you strength to stand up to those things you can't stand up to by yourself. The coming of the Lord means that you have the wisdom, the strength, the power that you can't find anywhere else. When we say, blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it's typically in preparation to come forward to receive Jesus' very body, the very body and blood given on the cross of Calvary into our temples. The dwelling of the Holy Spirit to make us holy and to show that God is with us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Our Lord Jesus is a man on a mission. And even better than that, he is a man on a compassionate mission. And now let us ever walk with Jesus, follow his example pure, through a world that would deceive us and to sin our spirit's lure. Onward in his footsteps treading, pilgrims here, our home above, full of faith and hope and love. Let us do the Father's bidding. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you die. Let us suffer here with Jesus. Let us gladly die with Jesus. And let us also live with Jesus. He has risen from the dead. That to life we may awaken. Jesus, you are now our head. We are your own living members. Where you live, there shall we. In your presence constantly, living there with you forever. Jesus let me faithful be, life eternal, grant to me. Amen. And may that peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.